if you're not in the hobby, you've probably heard of one of Lifelike Train's associated companies. Its story is twistier than the average mountain railroad, and has humble beginnings. The company that would eventually form lifelike trains had very humble origins. In the 1930s, two young sons of Lithuanian immigrants, Saul and Luke Harmer, which were at the time living in Baltimore, borrowed roughly $40 from their mother and set up a small manufacturing company to produce model planes they dubbed the Burb Model Plane Corporation. The brothers discovered that the material they needed, balsa wood, was readily available very inexpensively, and by inexpensive I mean free, by utilizing discarded fruit crates. These were being left by the side of the road for disposal at the time there was no recycling. Essentially, the companies were revolutionary in this regard, as they were utilizing recycled goods to produce their products. Pacific Naval Bastion. On December 7, 1941, Japan, like its infamous Axis partners, struck first and declared... Thanks to their extremely efficient method of gaining materials and other such clever maneuvers, the company by the time World War II had reached the United States doorstep had over 200 models. Unfortunately, World War II would put an end to their manufacturer, as even balsa wood and rubber to produce their propeller-driven mo motors wouldn't be available. Once World War II came to an end, the company's interests would diversify drastically from model cars to fishing tactics. While model trains wouldn't be their first move out of World War II, it would prove to be a very profitable area the company would focus more on as time went on. these were demolished beyond repair. One item that would prove highly profitable the Karmers would get into was a natural moss grown in Norway called lichen. This could be dyed green and used for a wide variety of shrubbery for model train layouts. This was highly revolutionary at the time, as most of the scenery decorations of that period were man-made and had the less than realistic appearance. On top of that, they usually cost more than the natural moss in which the brothers had found to import. Another product line that lifelike would become synonymous with were styrofoam tunnels. At the time, most tunnels were made out of cardboard. The company initially attempted to utilize paper mache, but had less than convincing results, and were also very these were also very prone to damage just from sitting around. The company came up with a unique concept of using polystyrene molded and then formed. It's been reported that several factory employees found they could simply put their lunches inside one of these tunnels and it would keep them cool. This whole product line was spun off again into its own separate company called Linfoam that would continue to produce the actual product of the tunnels themselves as well as one other. Right, the original ice chest you usually would take to the beach and or to a picnic etc were in fact produced by the same company that made trading tunnels. While these products were all well and good, there was one oversight. The company didn't actually, well, produce its own trains. The company was reliant upon other manufacturers to actually have trains to stage their products with. This would change in 1960. Enter model railroad pioneer Gordon Varney, who was now aging with a heart ailment and looking to sell his company off. By this point, he had moved his company to Florida. Among Varney's greatest achievements was an all-wheel drive locomotive, utilizing a nylon reinforced torque tube, as he called it, to drive the front truck truck off the rear truck's power truck. This system predated Atherin, who was still using rubber bands at the time to get all-wheel drive to his locomotive wheels. By the time the Karmers were about to take the company over, it was little more than a distributor to RSO. This is not to say they weren't making new products. The company had produced this new RS-11 model that was revolutionary in its time, being the only ship in town if you wanted a model of an RS-11. It predated the famous Atlas model by about 20 years. The model itself is crude by today's standards, but back then it was revolutionary. This is a later variation we're looking at here with an all-wheel drive system in it. Now when I say all-wheel drive, don't think of Atherin proportions. We're talking about a three-pole motor, as we see mounted here, that was known for being jerky and a bit on the annoying side to keep running smooth. Nonetheless, it was still revolutionary for what it was, as it was able to drive all four wheels for a price roughly half of what Atherin was charging back in the day. Interesting side note, if this model does look familiar, it was in fact produced for AHM, as well as for Model Power, as well as for Bachmann, and a variety of other manufacturers that outsourced their production, and or were distributors, I should say, from the RSO company, which would eventually be known as Mehano in its later years. Again, the three-pole motor came in later on. The original systems were four-wheel drive setups with a single power truck and torque-style motor. The Karmers would close the deal with Varney scale models sometime around 1960, and, well, after that point, nothing much happened. Essentially, everything remained the same until roughly around 1970.
As we can see, at slower speeds, this engine is very clearly a very reluctant runner at best. Admittedly, it isn't the cleanest operating example of this engine around, but it was not as smooth as you would get with the products such as Atlas and other such manufacturers. So bear in mind, for the time, it was a revolutionary product in itself. If you're wondering why this part of the video seems somewhat lacking in new content, it's because, well, nothing really happened to Varney scale models. Except for, unfortunately, Gordon Varney dying of his heart ailment in 1965. It would take until 1970 before the company was actually acknowledged as being a lifelike company property and being rechristened lifelike trains. This is one of their first models, an F7 unit in the spirit of 76 colors. This particular set was part of a set that I acquired, of all places, in Baltimore when I went to visit my aunt and uncle several years ago. Now, while these early models were essentially not much different from what had come before from Varney scale models, this would change. In 1973, Soul Karma would eventually come into contact with Wang Sing Ting, an industry leader in model type production of electric motors, etc., which would eventually form what would become known as Sandikan. This particular manufacturing company would eventually redesign the whole drivetrain. This particular locomotive again predates that. Thanks. As you can see underneath the hood now, the model itself has a very unusual motor style setup. It is in fact a standard can motor, but not in the way we're thinking of the usual pancake designs. This actually had a habit of running much better than what those later pancakes would be. At any rate, it has one gear on the top here from the motor going down to a gear on the truck, which in turn drives these four plastic wheels. There is no power pickup on this set of wheels again, it all comes through the front. Although interestingly enough, they are nickel silver wheels on this. An interesting notation as we'll see in a little while. If we take a look further, we see that the motor has a commutator built into this section right over here. The brushes are mounted right behind this little metal bracket right over here. It's a very simplistic drive system, basically, and very robust. In fact, much better than what would come later. Again, if you look closely at it, this is, in fact, one half the drive system that was featured in Varney's earlier all-wheel drive locomotives, except in this case, the front truck obviously not being geared, and the rear truck strictly being the only powered truck that's actually driving locomotive. Of course, again, it had plastic wheels on the back instead of metal wheels all around. And here is a shot of the model that Wei Sang Ting would eventually begin to produce for Lifelike. On the outside, it looks the same. In fact, if we look very closely, it has the same basic mounting structure that the earlier model that we looked at just before, the Spirit of 76, as we see there, has. Essentially, these two chassis can be swapped back and forth. But underneath the hood, unfortunately, there isn't much in the way of improvement. In fact, in most cases, it's all negative. Under the hood, we can see what I was talking about. As we can see, it's a very, very basic design. A cheap plastic chassis with a bunch of very cheap weights tied in place with a few screws, and two wires running across to a truck, which, is, which in turn has two more wires running to a headlight. In sharp contrast to the other locomotive, which had a split chassis and a completely different separate can motor. The motor itself is a ring motor and is not balanced, produced also lacking a bearing. This causes it to run quite rough. Let's take a closer look and see the mechanicals on board this one. As you can see here, two lights run off the motor that power the headlight, and two more wires again run off to the truck itself, which in this case is composed of brass wheels. The brass wheels themselves do not do a good job of picking up contact, in fact this is dogless locomotive from its existence point, as these were known for corroding so badly that they wouldn't conduct much power of any. Further aggravating the brass wheel design was the infamous motor power truck, composed of a ring motor with four cheap plastic wheels with traction tires and very cheap brushes. It further aggravated the situation that this locomotive always seemed to find every possible weak point in even a well-maintained model railroad layout. To call these engines poor performers is an understatement. To get this example running here, for example, I had to set the throttle to full speed as I had to back in the day. As you can see by the power pack, please note the brand I had to use, as I don't have enough parallax track to, dis to demonstrate this with that. And as you can see, my best efforts, I still have to push the train around the track. This again is why I referred to these trains when I was a kid as push trains, because they essentially needed to be pushed around the track with the throttle wide open a few times before they would come to life. And yes, the track is clean.
Well, after several attempts at <coughs> choice adjectives, I did finally get the engine to start to run smooth. Although, again, even then it wasn't running the way it was supposed to, as we'll see in a second here. Again, the throttle is set at full, and if I dare to back off of it, this locomotive will definitely stall. The engine was in storage for a while, but still, this is quite atrocious. I don't know of any locomotive that needs this kind of abuse just to get going after it's been in storage for just a short time. And if I remember correctly as a kid, this is what it took to get any of these engines running that had been sitting around for even a short amount of period of time. I don't dare turn the throttle off full, as it will definitely stall. What I guess what's most disturbing about this whole thing is that, well, this locomotive, despite its terrible performance, was basically what Lifelike offered in its train sets for most of its existence. Let's actually try another example just to balance the scales on that. Getting one of these engines to go was a challenge, to put it mildly. For the most part, these engines weren't built to the highest standards to begin with, and any kind of sitting, even if they were sitting in a package for a while before the said child got them, well, that could basically have dramatic effects on them, as we can see here. At full throttle, the th this train isn't going anywhere. In order to get this thing to run, I have to coax it by pushing it around the track a few times to get the motor to start to spin over. If you're wondering why I'm spending so much time showing you how difficult these engines are to get running, it's to make it very clear just how cheaply made these things really are, and just how bad they are. There really is no excuse for how poor these locomotives ran, and yet Lifelike did nothing about them for almost its entire period of existence. In fact, adding further insult to injury, these were the only locomotives the company sold outside of its train sets at that time. This would change later on. We'll get into more of that later. Admittedly, even to get those two locomotives to run as terribly as they did, I had to do a lot of cleaning and scraping on the wheels. Let's take a look at a different locomotive now from another make, Bachman, and see how it works. Now again, this locomotive has not had any cleaning done, as you can see, by all the dust on it. Let's see what this one does. Just to show the difference, immediately it starts running, no issues whatsoever. And slow! I can keep along here, whereas the other two engines would stall when I backed off the throttle the slightest bit. For good explanation on for the reason for the discrepancy of why these engines run so drastically different, let's take a look under the hood. Over here we have the lifelike chassis with its infamous single power truck with its plastic wheels and only one collector truck connected up with a few simple wires that also connect up to a headlight. The Bachmann locomotive above this we see has many more wires connected up. Why is that? And what exactly is going on here? Well, let's take a closer look and find out. Upon closer inspection, we see that the motors on the back, these pancake-style motors, appear to be exactly the same, but in fact, they are in fact different. If we look closely on the top of the lifelike, we have a hole here, and it's ever so slightly wider. The Bachmann, on the other hand, is fl the other Bachmann, on the other hand, is straight. It's got slightly, it's a slightly more narrow motor, and also does not have that hole on the top. Now, the rumor stating that this motor here that's in the lifelike is basically a cast-off from, from the Kadar group, which owns Bachmann. In fact, this is not the case. What I would say is most likely possible is that basically, because the industry was so, so intertwined at the time, and so many different engineers had their fingers in so many different pies, there's a good chance that someone was either inspired by the Bachmann when they developed this motor. 
motor, at least at one point in its life. Or maybe just the opposite, as the Bachmann motor, I believe, wasn't even out at the time this motor was being built. This is actually the first company to come out with a pancake-style motor, and Kadar would later start producing it for their own brand when they cheapen their models. The Bachmann locomotives before this period actually had all-wheel drive with a center point mounted motor in the middle of the engine itself, not like this one right over here. Underneath, we can see the drastic difference between the two models. The lifelike again with its single brass pickup truck, and the Bachmann again with all-wheel pickup and nickel-silver wheels. As we'll see, the nickel-silver give this locomotive a huge advantage. As we can see on the Bachmann locomotive, it has nickel-silver wheels all around. This helps to enhance conductivity, and these nickel-silver wheels at the same time aren't prone to corrosion, which meant that the engine was easier to get going. We also see that the wiring is actually going to all of the wheels, including the ones on the power truck. Now while this makes for a lot more wiring and a bit of a mess on the top one might call it, in terms of the way all these wires are going in different directions, the end result is a smoother running engine that runs more reliably. The motor is also of a higher quality, quality as well. As we look at the lifelike, we can see that the wiring system is very basic. There are basically two wires coming from the front motor truck, or power truck I should say, going back to the motor truck, and two wires off the motor truck back to the headlight. That's it. And why is that? Well, if we turn it over, we see that this front truck here, as we see, is the only pickup truck, and it's co composed of brass wheels. These are known to corrode, and they don't pick up power as well as the nickel-silver wheels. And again, this is the only pickup section, so much more stress and much more, basically, demand is put on this truck, and if the wheels aren't perfectly clean, it's going to show up much, it's going to be much more sensitive to unstable track and bed conductivity. Further insulting the whole thing as well, the back truck isn't even made of metal. The, wheel, the wheels, I should say, are not even made of metal. It has plastic traction tires, uh, rather it has plastic wheels with, plastic tr with uh, rubber traction tires. Again, plastic wheels on a power truck. We can see just how cheaply these motors were made if we take a look at this one. While it looks very promising with the shiny commutator and everything else, again, this motor has a, this is a new old stock locomotive essentially that never ran correctly as it has a problem with its dry drive on here, and I'm wondering that's why if I got, was able to get the train set a few years ago at the price I did. At any rate, this, this particular motor, as we see, is composed of very cheap plastic, and one of the pivot arms, as it's called, this little or pivot shafts, I should say, which is this piece of metal here, which has actually been magnetized, as it actually has been off for quite some time, that should actually be right over here, broke off. And the reason being is, again, the cheap plastic that holds it in place, right in that little connection, I don't know how well this will come out is shot. So as a result, this pivot can't be reattached very easily. And to be honest, this motor, in my case, really isn't worthwhile repairing. I'm probably just going to put those parts aside and do otherwise. There really is no need, because there are so much better engines out there you can get for so much less. You really don't need to be messing around with it. Here's the commutator assembly right over here. See that? And the other side. But again, very cheaply made, very plasticky, not very well done. It's easy to see with this disassembled motor as to why these things run so terribly in addition to the bad contact provided by the infamous brass wheels which these units have, as you can see by this disassembled unit right over here on these trucks. If we take a look here, the shell itself is complete plastic, and cheap plastic at that. The brushes are mounted right in here, which you will have seen in the previous video, but just to reiterate, they go in. I have them right over here. They go into these holes right here, which is where the commutator is behind. This spins and provides power. Now, while this looks nice and shiny, it's not very well manufactured, I assure you. If we see here, there are some imitation chem uh, metals used on the side here. It appears to get the commutator to function. Uh, the weight is not an actual piece of metal. It's some cheap knockoff of metal. Now, these brushes aren't the worst I've ever seen, but they're not the greatest either. In fact, they're nowhere near the greatest. But they're not the worst problem what this motor has. And that problem has nothing to do so much with its build quality. It has to do with the fact that Lifelike made this motor completely unchanged for pretty much its entire history of making train sets, with the exception of the earlier era, as I showed you before with the earlier drive setup. This was there, This was there. it stayed, stayed, and stayed. And there were no attempts made ever to upgrade this, except for some minor attempts with Walters when they took the company over. As for this motor, as you can see, it's just a part source. I can just use this basically now to explore things better. The commutators we pull out very carefully here. Again, it's attached inside. This is the bearing on the other side that makes contact with the base. Like that. There's a washer that prevents it from grinding against the shell. 
And inside the motor case, we can see the cheap plastic again that was used to do this. It really is unfortunate how badly these things were assembled. But unfortunately, it's what you had to put up with if you had a lifelike train set. It should also be noted that the company did produce steam engines too. Although these might look pretty familiar to the average experienced small railroad in the crowd. I'll go into that in a bit. Right over here we have an 040 dockside style steam switch engine with a style tender. Admittedly, this engine's a bit on the timid side to run, but it has been sat in its box for its entire life. Kind of rare to find one of these things, although this model cost me only a whopping $9 on eBay. And here again we have another 040, in this case a tank engine. Now if you haven't figured it out by this point, yes this engine and the previous one were both in Varney's catalog before the company was bought out by Lifelike. And essentially they would remain in production throughout Lifelike's lifetime. Of course, as far as I could tell toward the end of the company's life, they were reduced in the numbers available. Taking the shelf and looking under the hood, we can see how basic the drive system is. Two wires running to a standard cam motor with a single worm gear shaft that drives, two wheel, drives the wheel system underneath, which again is driven by the drive shafts on the side. All wheels pick up power, all wheels drive. Interesting enough, this engine, as we saw in those photos, actually runs a little bit better, in fact, noticeably better than the entry-level diesel locomotives Lifelike was building at the time. Again, this most likely has something to do with the fact that it was essentially a holdover from the Varney days, very heavily rooted in the old AHM slash Mihano slash RSO design, depending on how you know the company. Over here we have an interesting specimen. This is actually a rail carrying, uh, uh, auto carrying car, I should say, that I had when I was a kid. Looks distinctively retro with this top and lower auto carrying style rack. This has long since been, been taken out of use in the United States because, well, people like to throw rocks at them, unfortunately, and because of other security issues. Now, this one I had back in the 90s, or late 80s, actually early 90s I think I got this, and it took a trip to the concrete floor and broke. I had one very similar to this that I used to run on my layout that's even in one of my earlier videos if you want to look at that. And now I'd like to do something kind of special. I'd like to unbox exactly what became of this and what became the brand new replacement for this design by Lifelike that would took over for this position for this product. And well, here goes nothing. And what a shock! It looks exactly the same. Again, this is the same sort of not caring about it. Maybe not caring so much, but sort of build things as they were. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Although in reality, these cars were broken before they even got off the assembly lines. Cheap plastic wheels, cheap plastic construction. They did pretty well considering what they were, but there was nothing here to write home to mom about. It's unfortunate, but this thing yet again, as with everything else, stayed in production until the end of the train set production years. And here we have some scenery items that we used throughout Lifelike's existence. Again, nothing was done to change it, except the packaging was revised. We have a manufacturing company. Let's see here we have this little screen scene master crane setup. Again, nothing changed on this. They just changed the packaging on them. We had some dump trucks, good for the construction site that is included in this. Never did find the other one. Again, this all came from one of their train sets, the Elevated City train set. And over here we have the Downtown Business Center, which I own one of these already on my layout. Those of you who have seen my live sessions may have noticed it in the Seacliff Yard area where I usually start all of my sessions where my main yard is located. As a Pulling Valley, small Italian restaurant and a few other nice little things. I guess even, even uh, scale-made figures have to have some place to go for fun. 
And the interesting thing again about all these things, and I'd love to show you further info on them and give you more info as to how they matured over the years, but well, they didn't. Essentially, yet again, I know I sound like a broken record, they remained completely stagnant. The, those are what they had, and that's what they stuck with. No changes were ever made to any of the scenery items whatsoever. Just the packaging. That's it. And quite pathetically, if I do say so myself. And here is again another one of these ubiquitous items they offered. This flashing storage tank. I am to also have one of these things, which is also a uh, railroad tower. I don't know where I put that one, but I'm going to have to probably find it for my yard, as I'd love to have one in place, since I do have a very detailed yard. Again, same story here again. The packaging changed. This, is, I think, was the last generation of packaging these units had before they were finally phased out. talk about the operating accessories the company had. This is one of my favorites, if not my favorite. It's a vintage version of their logging mill, which you could get with several different train sets and was again sold right through the history of the company. In fact, if we take a look at the next clip right over here, we see that, yep, it was available right until the end, only with different packaging. Exact same kit, exact same stuff. Still fun to play with, but come on guys, seriously? And then there were these log dumpers and gravel dumpers. I had one of each of these, at least. In fact, I think I had two of the log dumpers. I used to love pulling the train up and pulling the lever and watching the logs get dumped. As simple as this was, as a kid, it was really enjoyable. But again, the principal problem was, well, nothing changed. They were exactly the same accessories straight through till the end. Now, if it sounds like there's a consistent theme going on here, you'd be right. All the train sets, all the accessories, etc., were essentially the same stuff being repackaged with new packaging and, or in the case of the train sets, with new varieties put together to form one set. This wasn't to say they were necessarily terrible sets, although some would probably agree with that statement. They weren't the greatest thing either. Lifelike would continue this policy of consistent ubiquity even into the era of Bachman Easy Track. Now, this particular track was a revolution in its time. Now you had tracks that could be set right up on the carpet, did not require any kind of fancy nails, etc., to get down, locked together, and stayed together. Although this track wasn't perfect, there were quite a few flaws with it. To start with, there wasn't much an innovation going on here, if we're at all honest. All Bachman did was design interlocking pieces of plastic, which they could mount Code 100 HO scale track to, utilizing all the same annoying flaws. The response Lifelike would give initially was kind of pathetic. As we see here, we have two standard pieces of Code 100 tracks with two little bumps on them. After slipping the two tracks together, as we see here, the corresponding links hook right into the plastic shell itself, which in turn can be placed right in between the two tracks and holds them rigidly together, as we'll see in a second here. Now, while this locking system certainly held the tracks better together than the Easy Track system did, Lifelike tended to overpromote it, claiming that it would basically be able to be set up on floors. This is never a good idea, especially if one happens to stumble into a room with very heavy shoes on and or boots. It basically would make mincemeat of this track in seconds. Lifelike would eventually have to come up with a better response, and it did come in the form of Powerlock. Now this product, I have to say, was one of the cases where Lifelike really got a product right, and did a very good job of responding, especially by addressing the flaws of its competitor's product. As we can see right here, what Easy Track is essentially is, if you, as you notice very carefully, it's just basically Code 100 Track attached via glue to a specially molded piece of plastic and secured with special locking devices. The problem is, with this track, is that it has the same flaw that all HO scale track has suffered from from the beginning, and that is at the very joining point right here, as I'll show you. The areas where these tracks join always have stress on them, because it's the point where all the stress is directed toward. If you're wondering what the big deal about all this is, it's really quite simple. If there's any stress on this particular point, as so, let me just connect this back together, this track will twist back and forth. The twist will cause the metal rail joiners or track connectors or whatever you'd like to refer to them as to warp and as they warp they won't make proper contact with the tracks causing, erra causing erratic power and therefore erratic performance from the locomotives. The thing that's frustrating is that Bachman had to have some idea this was going to happen but did nothing about it and just built them like this. The other issue with this is because trains, anyone who again is familiar with building HO scale layouts, when you don't have tracks secured yet and you're, uh, and you're roughing things out, if you put too much stress on the joining point 
the track will want to separate. And because these join in that same method of actually having the stress point be the separating point, they are very prone to coming apart. Worse still, that's if they're weak. If they're in too good a shape and these plastic locks are not properly incorrect, if they're the other way around where they're too sharp, they will actually not disconnect easily at all. And a lot of times you'll wind up breaking one of these off, which will render the track almost useless as it's hard to reconnect these once they break. Now let's see what Lifelike did about this. This, mind you, mind you, I should mention this debut, mind you, Easy Track debuted somewhere in the early 90s, so by 96 it was very clear something had to happen. And luckily by that point, Lifelike was ready with its answer, Power Lock. Now to start with, we can see it is not molded into the, into the track itself. It is not simply attached. It is physically molded, I should say, and joined as, and bonded as part of the track. The rails are physically attached to this plastic port right here. They attach not the uh, two locking devices protruding, protruding in a vertical way or horizontal way. They, they, they attach diagonally. The advantage of this is that it gives a very strong connection, and as we'll see in a second here, this is one of the main flaws this track does have, as it is kind of difficult to get together, but once you get it together, it doesn't let go very easily at all. There we go. Once it's together, it doesn't go anywhere. This is, root, this is very, very tight, and it's not moving back or forth, because the connection won't allow it to, as it overlaps both sides to spread the stress point out. It also connects diagonally across, further keeping the stress off the joining point. Another ingenious thing you'll note is that there are no rail joiners on this at all. And here's how Lifelike got around this. If you note at the end here, you have these two little spring-like pieces of metal. This is actually what transfers the power. When the tracks join, these two pieces of metal touch each other and press against each other. The constant and consistent force on the tracks allows them to stay connected and prevents any kind of joining issues at all. Essentially, this track is pretty much foolproof in all ways. Unfortunately, it never got the respect it deserved because, yet again, it was saddled by the prehistoric junk I showed you before being bundled with it. The aging pancake drive locomotives really did a number on this track, and it's unfortunate because it ruined a product that was pretty much perfect. And that's exactly what Lifelike did. They repackaged the same old stuff with this new revolutionary track that really deserved better. Here are a few of my favorites. The higher end burning rubber. Ooh, I remember the Freight Challenger. Yeah, Railmaster, that was a pretty decent set. Drooled over it a couple times. Oh, yeah, that was a classic. I always wanted the Freightline USA model. Oh, and just the burning rubber. Oh, did I ever want slot cars? Still haven't gotten one of those. Got to get one of these one of these days. Oh, and yes, the roaring diesel with its sound effects. Wow, I really wish I had gotten those sets. In fact, I wonder why I never did... Oh, yeah, that's right, they all sucked. And that's the principal problem that prevented me and a lot of other people, I'm sure, from buying these models. As, yeah, they'd run fine for a while, but once they started to age, they were basically a maintenance nightmare and not much else. Even more shocking than all of this was the fact that Lifelike continued to market these locomotives separately, even though they really, really led quite a bit to be desired. As if the company was delusional about what it was selling. No, they even had the monumental goal to run this ad talking about how powerful their locomotives were and how capable they were of pulling things. Please, who did they think they were kidding? In case you're wondering why I stuck with lifelike trains despite their quality problems as a kid, it's really quite simple. They were very accessible. You could get them at uh, your local Toys R Us. In fact, their entire catalog of accessories and even bespoke train sets were available at Toys R Us, this one costing like $25 back in the day. The way Lifelike dealt with its competition seemed to be more and more delusional by the day. Here we have the digital commander set by Bachman, two, a set that included two DCC-equipped locomotives and a DCC system for a good price. Lifelike's response, this set, basically the elevated city rails, one train above the other, each powered by a power pack itself. I mean, seriously, this is what they call DCC? Two separate trains on analog loops? Luckily, Lifelike would finally get the message and design locomotives more appropriate for the era it was selling trains in, with all-wheel drive, high detail, the works. And that'll be covered next time in my next part of this series, the Proto 2000-1000 years. Before I close out for this evening, I'd like to draw your attention to hoseeker.net. It's a great resource page if you're collecting locomotives as well as rolling stock and accessories. It's a great place all around if you're really into collecting vintage trains. That'll do it for tonight, so everyone please keep the metal side down and take care, and thanks again for watching.